Hi guys, welcome to today's live. Ooh, let me adjust this really quick so you can see it. <laughs> you know, Coldest Water sponsors literally every single one of my videos. I love them. Um, let me go ahead and wait for more people to join before we get into the actual presentation today. And I'm not using Zoom, so it might be a little different. I'm trying to figure out how to use the different screen recording softwares. Um, let me first of all know if you guys can hear me. That would be amazing because, I mean, I don't know if you can hear me or not. <laughs> Okay, let me just check in, waiting for a few more people to join. I'm so sorry that I am late, you guys. Um, it's, oh man, oh, and my dog's whining now. It literally has been such a long day, and one of the horses at our barn was put down today, and it was just so freaking sad, and man, it was just awful. Um... <laughs> So, I hope y'all's day is going better than mine. Um, okay, so today we are going to be talking about how whips slash crops really affect horses. And again, I'm going to try to use the screen recording software I have because it's, I'm hoping to not use Zoom anymore because it's just really low quality. Um, <laughs> but I don't really know uh, how this is going to work out. So let's just hope it, it works. Okay. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and exit out of this really quick. So we're just going to go ahead and start talking about whips and crops. So obviously in today's live stream, you know, there's a big difference between using whips and crops as tools versus how a lot of people use them, which is most of the time for disciplinary or encouraging methods. Um, okay. Um, you guys know my thoughts on whips and crops and I have a whip, I have a lunge whip, but I never use it to actually physically touch my horse unless I'm tapping him very gently for like trick training or something. Um, I also don't really have a problem with little kids whose feet don't make it past the saddle pads or the saddle, and then they have to use a crop usually on the upper shoulder or neck region, just so that way the horse can like feel them and not actually hit, but just little taps, just as like an extension of your leg. There's a big difference between using a whip or a crop for just like lightly tapping training purposes or something, but I mean, there's a very big difference between that and then also like physically beating your horse or using it for disciplinary measures. So we're going to dabble a little bit into how much they hurt horses, but I don't want to focus on that because we've focused on that quite a lot in the past. We have talked a lot, very in depth on how sensitive horses are. So you can go and watch any of my other videos if you're interested in knowing but we need to focus on do they actually work for the purposes of what a lot of people use them for in my opinion they don't i think they're really counterproductive i don't think whips actually accomplish the things that riders want them to accomplish by disciplining their horses with them and there was a study that we're going to go over that actually proves that whips and crops are counterproductive and that hitting a horse with them for encouragement or um, disciplinary reasons is not effective. So we are going to go over all of that stuff today. <sighs> I'm excited. Let's go ahead and let me see if I can get down this screen transfer because guys, I mean, I'm not the most tech savvy person. <laughs> And, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll, we're going to try. <laughs> okay. Mm, let's see. Okay. So, let me go ahead and check and see. I know I'm going to show you guys the live really quick. I'm just trying to check and see if this is working properly. Yes, it is. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. We're going to do presentation mode for this. So, 
Um, how whips slash crops, because they're both basically the same thing. I mean, we're not going to be talking about like lunge whips in this video. We're not going to be talking about um, whips that are, you know, used for directional purposes. So I don't want to talk about lunge whips in this video, but we're going to be talking about whips slash crops, what you use when you're riding for like phys physically disciplining your animal or um, using it for encouraging taps. Like a lot of jumpers will use it for that purpose. So we are going to be going over a study that is on an investigation of horse racing performance and whip use by jockeys in thoroughbred races. This was done by um, the Faculty of Veterinary Science at the University of Sydney in New, Th in New South Wales. So, first we need to go over why do riders use whips and crops? Excluding lunge whips, because those are often not used to make contact with the horses, we're going to be discussing these main factors, which is most riders consider a whip as an extension of their arm or leg. Some riders will use crops to, quote, motivate a lazy horse to move forward with just the presence of the whip, which is really kind of psychotic in my opinion because, I mean, if you're motivating a horse to move forward just by the presence of a whip, that means that that horse is scared of it. And that's definitely like negative training right there. And you shouldn't be doing that. Um, whips are also used by riders to discipline horses that don't do what they're asked or push a horse into an uncomfortable situation, AKA going over a scary jump, running faster in a horse race, etc., etc. The objective of this, of today's live, is to figure out, is it necessary to use whips for riding and training purposes in horses? How much do whips really hurt horses? So that's what we're gonna be going over. So we're gonna go ahead and exit and watch a few of these example videos on um, bad examples of whip and crop use. But unfortunately, a lot of people do this. There's plenty of people out there. I don't wanna say that this is like a one-time thing because there's plenty of people who treat their horses this way. So let's go ahead and watch. I'm gonna get rid of that. So actually, I'm gonna close out of this video first. So we're gonna watch this one. Let me fit it to my screen. This one came out a couple months ago and it's really bad, but this is unfortunately how a lot of people treat their horses, especially when their horses are not wanting to go over jumps or they're not wanting to listen. elimination excessive use of the stick. <laughs> PETA, I love it. <laughs> so, that video is a really good example of bad equestrians. And then we have this video, which is also a really good example of more bad equestrians. And I know a lot of you, a lot of you guys have seen this video, but I'm going to show it anyway. So, again, let me go back to uh, my full screen really quick. 
So, um, pretty upsetting stuff, you know? I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to watch. Um, man, I mean, stuff like that is just, it's just depressing. I mean, there's so many people who treat their horses like that. And regardless of if you have a padded whip or whatever other excuse you wanna make, at the end of the day, I say this a lot, horses are just horses. And there's no excuse for treating your horse like that because they're just horses, you know what I mean? Like, they don't have a job, they, they're just animals. And the fact that people wanna be like, oh, this is their job, this is their thing, they're jumpers, they have to go over these jumps or they have to run this barrel pattern because a lot of barrel racers whip their horses too, or they have to run really fast on a track. It's like, no, they don't. Like, bitch, no, they don't. They're just animals. They don't have a job at the end of the day. They're just horses. And when people say stuff like they're disciplining their horse, it's like, why? The horse didn't do anything wrong. It's just a horse. And if there's a day where your horse doesn't want to jump, then fucking don't do it. You know what I mean? It's just so psycho. I just, I don't understand why people act like that. It's just so crazy. And so many people do it. This is not just one person or two people, okay? So that's why I think this is really important because I do fully believe that whips are an, an equine welfare issue. I really do. I think people have normalized the use of whips and crops in competitions, in um, horse races, in everyday riding activities. And again, it's completely different if you are going to use a whip or a crop for just light tapping purposes, like if you need to just get your horse's attention with a few light taps, or if you're a young child and you can't use your leg because it's not long enough to apply a little bit of pressure on the horse's side and you need to use a little light tap with the crop, that's completely different. It's also completely different to use it for directional purposes or something like that, but actually physically hitting your horse for encouragement or to make them run faster or for disciplinary reasons is the main reason why a lot of riders use crops and whips. I never ride with one. I mean, literally, I can't remember the last time I rode with a whip or a crop. I just find it completely unnecessary. And for all of those people who want to say that it does help and that it does help with their horse's behavior or encouragement or whatever, and that's why they use it, it actually doesn't. It's incredibly counterproductive, and that's what we're going to get into in this study today. So first things... Oh, sorry. Turn my camera back on because my god <laughs> i didn't even notice that my camera cut off hang on guys sorry i totally didn't even realize that my camera cut off there for a second but anyway yeah so it's incredibly counterproductive and we're going to be going over uh, all of that in today's video. <laughs> I know all of you guys are like, Raleigh, your camera cut off. Uh, luckily, the audio will still play if my camera cuts off, but my camera has like a 30 minute timer and then the screen will just randomly shut off. It's so annoying, but I don't know if I can fix that or not. <laughs> Anyway, um, let's go ahead and let's get back into the presentation and we're gonna first start off with going over the actual pain that horses feel. So this is more of like a empathetic start and then scientific end to this study. So obviously horses feel pain from padded whips and crops and those that are not padded as well. But the real issue here is telling people that yes, although these horses do experience pain, it's counterproductive because it's not actually doing what you think it's doing by by disciplining or motivating your horse, it's not actually doing that. So I think that's really important to get people to stop using them specifically because it doesn't do what you want it to do anyway. And then also if it's an ethical issue with the amount of pain it causes, then why use it, you know? And I do remember there was a study, you can go look it up on YouTube. I don't remember the name, but it was conducted with, um, European race horses, I believe, and they actually did an anatomical exam of a horse's 
hindquarters where the whip actually hits and they actually were able to pull back the skin and see the amount of bruising to the tissue that is caused when horses are repeatedly beaten in the hindquarters and in the front shoulder region. So that's really interesting. You can go watch that on YouTube. We might go over that in my next uh, live stream. And I will do questions at the end, you guys, once we're done with the, uh, the presentation. So let's get back into it. Really quick, let me put this back up here. Okay, present. Okay, so the purpose of this study, so the purpose of this study in quotes, because this is what it actually talked about on the actual study, which will be linked down below once this video is re-uploaded, uh, concerns have been expressed concerning animal welfare issues associated with whip use during thoroughbred races. Uh, also in many other cases, but this is just specifically focused on racehorses. However, there have been no studies of relationships between performance and use of whips in thoroughbred racing. Our aim was to describe whip use and the horse's performance during the races and investigate associations between the whip use and racing performance. So AKA, they are basically trying to determine in this study, not if whips hurt horses because I think that's that's non-debatable at this point. Everybody knows that whips do hurt horses, which we'll go over in our next slide before we get into this study, but they are trying to determine that yes, whips do hurt horses, but do they actually improve a horse's performance like the reason why people use them? So is there even a reason to use them? Do they even actually improve a horse's performance? So um, that's what we are going to go over. So before we get into that, let's again recap on horse skin and sensitivity. So horses, quote, have fewer skin cells between the environment and sensitive nerve endings. So horses actually have, this is horse skin and human skin. These little red and purple dots are nerve endings and humans are way less and more widely spread apart. Horses have a tremendous amount of more nerve endings in smaller areas, um, you know, more compressed together than humans, which means they are vastly more sensitive than people. If you want to go read these studies, I will try to find it and link them below. Um, again, over here, this is the thickness, and you can still see a lot of the nerve endings. This is the thickness of human skin, which is 0 0.08 millimeters, and this is the thickness of horse skin, which is 0 0.05 millimeters, okay? So horses actually have thinner skin than people do. So regardless of a padded crop or a normal crop, if somebody hit you with a crop, it is going to hurt a horse more than it's going to hurt you. So I want people to take that into consideration, okay? Padded whips are now required in both Australian and UK racing events, and there are clear rules about how these can and can't be used. However, despite padding, deformation of tissues remains a consequence. This is something that we went over when I made a video on whips a while back from that YouTube video I was just telling you guys about how the deformation of tissues under the skin where a horse is being actually hit with a crop still happens on a very regular basis to those animals. Uh, one other racing study in quarter horses determined that horses at the gallop showed that the use of a whip on the shoulder of the leading forelimb in rhythm with the stride, which is how a lot of jockeys use it, reduced the stride length and increased stride frequency without increasing speed. So essentially it just scared the horses. And it didn't actually make the horses run any faster by being hit with the crop in racing events. And again, going back to the deformation of tissues in horses that are hit with crops, I want to reiterate that this is with padded whips. So even though everyone's like, oh, but we use padded whips now and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, they've done many studies and it still deforms the tissue underneath the horse's skin. So think about that. Now, moving into the study. We're going to go ahead and talk about first how they conducted it. So 
They basically timed three different 20 meter sections of a race and they were recorded on these sensors that they placed on horses. Um, they were recorded from 600, 420 meter positions from the finish, okay? So the forehand and backhand whip strikes to the hindquarters with a padded whips, and you guys can go read all the specifications for the exact equipment they used and how they did it. I'll link it below. Um, as in the case with ARB, Stewart's current practice slaps. So basically they went along with all of the standard practices for how whips are used in uh, major racing events legally, okay? So none of this was done out of ordinary. A whip and or hand motion on the neck or shoulders with the jockey's hands on the reins. Uh, they were not included in the counts. So slaps are not only subject to regulation in the um, are, oh, okay. Slaps are not subject to regulation in the Australian Racing Board rules of racing. So there's multiple different types of this. These were mostly like specifically hits that they determined for this study. So times for the 200 meter sections from the 600, 420 meter positions were derived from an electronic timing system that used underground transmitters and a receiver in each horse's saddle cloth. The timing system also reported each horse's placing at the 600, 420 meter sections at the finish. So basically what this means, I know it's a little confusing, I'm gonna summarize. The electronic timing system that they placed under the horses actually determined how fast the horse was running at all these different positions to determine how fast the horse would run by the end if it were hit with a crop um, or not. So they're basically putting a, um, oh, what's the word? Oh God, a constant in this study. So basically they're saying, listen, if the horse was not hit with the crop based on this electronic timing system, this is how quick the horse would finish the race based on how fast the horse was running when it wasn't being hit with the crop. And this doesn't have anything to do with horses getting tired at the end. Cause I know a lot of horses get more tired towards the end of a race. And they actually included that in the study. So I don't want people to worry about that. But that's basically how this study was conducted. So all horses included in this study were ridden in a manner that maximized their opportunity of good performance. The results of this, now this was a really in-depth study, you guys can go read it if you want, but basically to summarize, the results of this study show that jockeys in more advanced placings, so the jockeys that had horses that ran faster at the 400 and 200 meter positions before the post in um, races wait, no, before they started whipping their horses more frequently, um, they finished sooner. However, to gain the advantageous placings at 400 meter positions, no horses were whipped between 400 and 200 meter positions, only half of them were whipped. And on average, this is the most important part, on average, they achieved highest speeds when there was no whip use. Even for the horses that were whipped, even though they finished, with a more advanced position and a quicker position than the other horses that weren't, they still didn't run any faster when they were being whipped as when they weren't being whipped, which is super important. So um, that increased whip use was not associated with significant maintenance of velocity as a predictor of superior race placings at the finish of the race. Further studies with onboard sensors of gait characteristics are required to study responses to whipping in individual horses. So essentially this is saying that although some of the horses that were whipped did place in higher positionings than the horses that weren't, they didn't run any faster when they started getting whipped than when they weren't being whipped. So yeah, it didn't, it didn't improve their performance at all, which is exactly what the other study in quarter horses showed was that the quarter horses, although they had a faster stride when they started being whipped, they didn't run any faster. So their stride was just shorter and it was kind of more um, frantic, if you can say, because they're, I mean, obviously they're being whipped. So they're gonna be a little bit more frantic. They're gonna be shorter stride a little bit more panicked and they're not going to run any faster than what they already were when they weren't being whipped. So I think that's a really important distinction. So here's at the end, should you use whips or crops? For the purpose of 
tool use or aids, right? So extremely light tapping for training aids or small children whose legs don't make it past the saddle for leg contact purposes, not hitting or kicking. Um, that's very important to note because again, it does not improve your horse's performance. And as you guys have seen time and time again, when it comes to horses that are um, being hit to go over a jump, or to run faster or something like that, or being hit to be disciplined, most of the time it just frustrates them. Most of the time the horse just gets really anxious and really nervous. A lot of the time they'll rear up, they'll freak out, they'll start bucking or, you know, swishing their tail or, you know, trying to get you off. A lot of the time it just makes the situation worse and it puts the horse into a panic flight or fight, you know, position. So, are whips necessary? No, they don't improve a horse's performance, which has been shown time and time again in multiple different studies. And they also um, should not be used for disciplinary reasons because I don't think it gets the point across to a horse. I think if anything, it just upsets them and then they just shut down and they don't want to work with you anymore. They get really frustrated. They just want to like escape the situation because they're fight or flight animals. So whips are not necessary to improve a horse's performance. It often frustrates the horse and is counterproductive. Whips do hurt horses, even padded whips. Horses are much more sensitive than people. So when you add both of these together, that whips are counterproductive, they don't actually improve a horse's performance and they frustrate horses that are being disciplined with them and they also hurt horses. It's like, why, why are we even using them? Like, what's the point? Unless you're going to use them for tool purposes, for aiding in your training as like an extension of your arm or leg just for light tapping, that's completely different. Oh, here. That's completely different than actually using it for the main reasons why most riders use them. So if you have a problem with your horse, reflect inward, figure out what you're doing wrong and your lack of communication or training methods with them. A lot of times when people have issues with their horse, it's because there's a lack of communication between the horse and the rider. Figure out what you're doing wrong. Figure out how to improve yourself as a rider and not just discipline your horse for any little thing he does. So let's go back to me. Hello, hello, hello. Let me exit out. Um, yeah, so final thoughts on this would be, should you use whips or crops? Yeah, sure. If you want to use them for tool purposes or for aid purposes, absolutely. But as it's been shown time and time again, whips and crops don't actually have the effects that people think they have on horses. People are like, oh, whip the horse when he doesn't go over the jump. Okay, well, if anything, that's just going to frustrate the horse and it's going to make him not want to go over the jump. So it just, it makes me really mad when people do stuff like this, when you could use positive reinforcement to get a horse to go over a jump. Like, even if you're just rewarding a horse with treats once they go over the jump to be like, yay, good job, that was fucking awesome. That type of shit is so much easier. It's so much better for your animal. And that's such an easier way to train with positive reinforcement. And so many people think that giving a horse treats is gonna make them really naughty or bratty. That's not true, dude. Like my, <laughs> it makes me laugh when people say that because I've been using treats as positive reinforcement in my horse for his entire life. And my horse is not bratty. Like, I mean, I just think it's funny when people say stuff like that because, I mean, do you really want a horse that's just some dead piece of machinery that's just gonna, you know, do whatever you ask just because he's gonna be beaten down if he doesn't? I mean, it's just... Think about the ethical standards that we want to have as equestrians, right? Like, I feel like every equestrian should hold themselves to a high ethical standard of giving your animal the best possible quality of life and understanding your animal as much as possible and realizing that you have to not be selfish. Equestrians tend to be really selfish and use horses for their own personal gain a lot of the time. So I think it's important to hold yourself to a really high ethical standard as an equestrian and be like, listen, no, like 
I'm going to start using positive reinforcement to work with my animal because stuff like this is just kind of old, outdated, and really barbaric. If you want to use, again, whips and crops for tool or aid purposes, that's different. But, I mean, come on, guys, let's be honest here. Most people don't use crops and whips for tool or aid purposes. Most people use them to discipline. We know that. Most people use it to, quote unquote, encourage, which is just a gross way of saying discipline. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, are they necessary? No. Do they work for what you want it to work for? No. Uh, they're very counterproductive and they're pretty abusive because if a crop hurts you, it's going to hurt a horse. And I think I should really go over that YouTube video in one of my next videos because it's so interesting when they actually did a, um, a dissection on a horse on his hindquarters and actually showed the tissue damage that was inflicted upon the muscle from being hit with a padded crop. So I think it's really important, again, to recognize the disconnect here between horse and rider and recognize that, I mean, a lot of horses do get really scared when someone's even riding with a crop. And it's like, do you really want your horse to ride in fear? Do you really want to have a fear-based relationship with your animal? Every time you ride with a crop, they're going to know that you're carrying it and that, you know, even the slightest little tap could possibly hurt them because they are so sensitive. And I think that's just something that a lot of people need to grasp and understand. I think it's important for equestrians to constantly reevaluate their ethical standards as a rider and make better choices moving forward, you know? So anyway, let's go ahead and let's answer some questions because I've been waiting. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Could you do different bits next or spurs? I think I'll do spurs next because I've seen a lot of people especially free riders, and I'm not going to name names, but I'm sure you guys know who I'm talking about. I've seen a lot of free riders who use spurs to free ride, and I'm like, that, that just that doesn't really make sense because the whole purpose of free riding is giving your horse a choice, and if you're using spurs uh, to free ride, you're not really giving your horse a choice because spurs do hurt horses. I mean, could you imagine we already went over the, um, you know, degree of horse sensitivity and how thin their skin is. Can you imagine being jabbed with something metal in your rib cage? I mean, can you imagine that? Like that would fucking hurt. And I think it's funny when, when free riders, you know, there's a few out there that are pretty big, they say stuff like, oh, well, I need to use it because I'm free riding. It's like, well, then you're not really free riding because you're still riding with a piece of equipment that is designed to apply a significant amount of pressure to an animal to get them to do what you want them to do. So, yeah. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll go over spurs in my next live. Maybe towards the end of the month, I might do another live stream, but I have so many videos lined up, you guys. And I'm also car shopping right now. I literally haven't been able to go out and see Link for like an entire week because I, as you guys know, I live down in LA and Link is about 45 minutes away from me. And, um, cause that's where my barn is and I love it there. And luckily my, my exercise rider has been so great and she's been able to take him out and I'm just so happy about it. But, oh man, it's been really hard on me because, <laughs> because I haven't been able to see him and I have like a rental car and I've just been car shopping for like a week and it's, it's so stressful. So I will do, um, a video on Spurs. Oh, thank you so much, Diamond. That's so sweet. Uh, will you ever do a video on Freely? No pressure. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the thing about Freely. Um, you guys can go watch The Unnatural Vegan because she's kind of had a bit of a back and forth with Freely lately, and I've been watching a lot of the videos. And Freely reminds me so much of Vegan Gains, who's also a really bad vegan example, and also that vegan teacher. They're all just extremist vegans, and they turn more people away from veganism than to veganism, and they also thrive on attention. They thrive on getting a rise out of people and getting people to react to them so they get views and create controversy. They're like vegan trolls. 
goals, right? But they also put out really terrible nutritional advice to the public, especially Freely. There's been so many people who have debunked her, like, raw till four uh, nutritional advice where she just eats like all raw food. I think that's what it is. I'm not sure. But a lot of people have debunked it and talked about how it's just really bad nutritional advice and you just should not listen to it. Um, so maybe not. <laughs> um, oh, thank you, Julia. Hey, Raleigh, love you. You're doing great. I hope you have a great day. Also, thank you so much for answering my question. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, that sucks. I hope you get a new car. I am getting a new car, you guys. I just haven't figured out which car I want to get because I sold my truck and trailer because A, I live in Southern California and driving around a truck on a daily basis is like not environmentally friendly at all. And it's not realistic because my truck is so huge that it was just a pain in the ass to like drive anywhere in it. So I was just so ready. I'm ready to get a smaller car, but I'm also getting a horse van for Link and whatever other horse I end up getting. So that way I can just have two vehicles and I don't have to have like a small vehicle, a truck and a trailer. It'll just be so much easier. Um, let's see. How do you use whips to correctly make a horse go faster from a trotty gallop? So I would say, honestly, if you're trying to get your horse to go faster, use your legs with just like light squeezes or use your voice, you know? I mean, a lot of horses will move forward with just voice command cues. And if your horse isn't responding well to voice commands, you should do a lot of groundwork with them like in a round pen and teach them to move up to different gates or like speeds to different voice command cues. And then once they get that down, they'd be more likely to pick it up under the saddle. Um, let's see. Why did you stop doing Raleigh Reacts? They were my favorite videos. I stopped doing Raleigh Reacts videos because it was just really hard for me to try to actually go in depth on animal abuse and cruelty when I was reacting to five different videos in one video. So I might do one or two more Raleigh Reacts videos in the future, but honestly, I like talking about one specific video and actually going in depth on studies on why that's abusive, why it's not okay, and actually analyzing the video rather than just being like, oh yeah, this is really abusive and next video, you know? Because then it's like, I can't explain myself and my opinions. It's all just so, you know, close together. And it was just, it was too much. Um, let's see, <laughs> let me just, double check and make sure my camera is not going to uh shut off okay let's see what are your thoughts on flag whips um they're the ones i know what flag whips are so flag whips i don't have a problem with those actually i know a lot of people use flag whips for desensitizing purposes a lot of people will use them when they're doing a lot of ground training for horses and i think it's totally fine i know that buck brenneman uses them a lot of the time i think pat pirelli does too and i think they're totally fine um i don't really have an issue with them so let's see I just started riding a little longer than a year ago, so I still use lesson horses. My trainer makes me use spurs and a crop, and I try my best to use my legs. Do you have any tips on how to not use them? If your trainer, because I get a lot of people who say stuff like this, a lot of times you can't choose what tack you're riding in, especially if it's a lesson horse. But if you tell your trainer that like, hey, I was reading some studies and, you know, whipping a horse and kicking them makes me really uncomfortable and I would rather try and use verbal cues or commands to get a horse to do something, a lot of times they'd be pretty receptive to that unless they're just an idiot. And if they come back and they're like, oh, you're such a baby for thinking that, I mean, then you probably wouldn't want to be riding there in the first place because you don't want to be learning from somebody who's so out of touch with reality that they think it's okay to like kick and whip horses. I mean, literally at my barn, like 
it's such a big thing. We do use whips, but we use them as tools, especially for the lesson kids. And we've had many lesson kids that have literally been kicked out of my barn because they've been too hard on the reins, pulling on the bit. They've whipped a horse way too hard or kicked a horse way too hard and we've corrected it. And it's like, if we have to keep correcting this problem and you start actually getting to the point where you're like abusing one of the lesson horses, you're done. So I think it's important to find a facility that aligns with your values and your views because, um, you know, obviously you don't want to be learning from people who suck and don't know what they're talking about because there's a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about in the horse world and that just sucks. But I mean, I went around to probably 20 or 30 different riding facilities when I was a little kid before I actually found one that I really liked. So just shop around, shop around different riding facilities. Um, let's see. Can you please talk about this Esme or make a video on her? I've been having doubts recently. What's up with her? I don't, I don't know what's up with her. I always thought she was like really unproblematic. Um, I don't know. Does any, is anybody gonna tell me what's up with her? Everyone's saying, can you talk about this Esme? I don't think she's done anything. Has she done anything? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I always thought that this Esme was really unproblematic. Um, I mean, I've never, I think I, ne I don't think I've ever made a video on her. I've always thought she was just really unproblematic and yeah, she, uh, she's, I don't think she's ever gotten in anyone's way. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything negative to say about her at all, honestly. Um, but let's see do i watch this as my no i don't watch her um i know that she makes really high quality horse videos though but i don't watch her that's why i was asking uh, what's up because i uh i uh, don't think she's done anything um let's see does bad riding hurt the horse it takes time to get better and i don't want to hurt horses in the process so yeah bad riding can hurt horses what i like to do is i like to focus on my riding i like to focus on my riding at each gate and make sure that i'm riding as efficiently as possible before i go up to the next gate right so once you can get down your balance at each gate it makes it a little bit easier the next time you go up to a faster gate and it makes it um it makes it a lot easier for your horse right so if you focus on each gate individually you're good to go um let's see any bitless training tips yeah for sure i'll definitely um i'll definitely make a video on my patreon probably on bitless training and like how to switch your horse over but i would say my best tips for people would be start out riding bitless in the round pin because round pins are very easy to teach a horse direction with different pressure points on their face that they're not used to so i mean for example if you're going left in a round pin and you're applying left on the reins it's really easy to teach a horse that that's the pressure they should expect when they're going left you know what i mean vice versa so round pins are really great to start out with for training bridalists or bitless any of that they're just great um, let's see. As an overweight rider of 200 pounds, what can I do to carry myself, um, easier as a new rider six months, uh, of lessons? That's a really good question. You can ride. If you are overweight, just make sure that you're riding a horse that can appropriately carry you and your tack. And also try really hard to just, again, focus on your strength and balance at each gate. 
uh, it's very simple i mean you can go watch any youtube video on it and you know talk to your lesson instructor on this is something you're struggling with this is something you want to work more towards and they'll help you out they'll help you out with taking weight out of the saddle because it's different for everybody everybody rides differently everybody has differences in the way they balance on horses uh, there's differences of balancing in western saddles and english saddles so it's all completely different um let's see oh thank you so much julia hey it's me again i was wondering what are some tips for cantering or loping because that's what i'm currently working on and perfecting it have a good day hope link is doing good too oh thank you so much that's so sweet um differences or not differences but tips for cantering or loping i would just say my biggest tip for people, especially since I've transitioned to dressage, my biggest tip is learning to relax and not tighten up when you pick up a canter because then it'll teach your horse to get really tense too. So I try to relax and I try to just sit deep in the saddle and allow my hips to move. You don't want to lock your hips and also don't clench your knees. That's something that I always tell people when they start cantering is try not to clench your knees because it ruins your entire position and your balance in the saddle and on the horse. So if you can just take your knees off the horse and focus focus on relaxing your legs and really pushing down through your heels, then it'll improve the rest of your riding position. But really the key here is just to relax, okay? Um, okay, last question. How do you think people should go about lesson horses um, and, school por school <laughs> and school ponies where the rider isn't able to train the horse with a voice cue or treats? Again, uh, if you feel like you're in a position where you're not using crops or whips or kicking as an aid, whereas like just light taps, and you're actually doing it in a way where you think it's abusive and that's what your lesson instructor is telling you to do, then I would find a different lesson school. I'm just saying that because I know what that feels like. I went to many lesson schools when I was a little kid that were like that, and trust me, you don't want to be learning from those people anyway because people who think that that's acceptable treatment of horses are not people who know enough about horses to where you want to be learning from them if that makes sense so anyway guys i love you guys so much i will see you guys in our next live stream i hope this was helpful i will re-upload this and i'll try to find that video to put in the description but otherwise, I love you guys so much, and I will see you guys in my next video. Oh, by the way, make sure to go check out the Link Equestrian Instagram and website, because tomorrow we are launching our um, plant-based hoodies, which is like Link and Rain from Spirit, and they're like eating apples. It's so cute. We're launching the 2.0 second version of those hoodies tomorrow morning, so make sure to go check that out, and I'll see you guys in my next video and thank you to coldest water again <laughs> i'll see you guys in my next video